There has been some big black hole news this week, and I mean big, ultra massive in fact, with the measurement of the mass of the black hole in the centre of the galaxy Abel 1201 at 32 billion times the mass of the sun. It's at the very top end of the masses of supermassive black holes that we find in the centres of galaxies that start out at around 1 million times the mass of the sun, and when they go over around about the 10 billion times the mass of the sun mark is when we start to throw around the words ultra-massive black hole. Now this is not the biggest black hole that we know of. We've seen bigger. It's comparable in mass to some of the biggest ones that we know, like the ones that we find in the centre of the likes of NGC 4889, NGC 6166, and A3558. But it is not the most massive. That crown goes to the supermassive black hole in the centre of TON618, which is 66 billion times the mass of the sun. More than double what's been found in Abel 1201. Now I've made a video before about physically how massive can black holes become that covers TON618 if you want to check that out. Or if you want more detail then I go into this in my book A Brief History of Black Holes as well which is available in all good bookstores or you can grab a copy from the link in the video description down below. But what's really interesting about this measurement of Abel 1201's black hole is the way that the mass of this black hole has been measured because it's the first of its kind and I think it's going to really open the door to more measurements like this in the next decade with all of the next generation telescopes that we've got coming online very soon. So to understand what's been done here we need to chat about how do we normally measure the masses of supermassive black holes. Well we can't see the black hole itself but we can see material orbiting around it whether that's individual stars like in our own Milky Way galaxy or for more distant galaxies gas that is spiraling around the black hole at a huge huge speeds, so much so that it gets hot and it starts to glow so that we can see it. Now individual elements and molecules glow at very specific colours or wavelengths. Take hydrogen for example. It's the most common element in the entire universe and it glows with a reddish pinkish colour with a wavelength of 656.28 nanometers precisely. So if you were going to observe the material that is spiralling around the black hole, which is mostly going to be hydrogen, and you take the light that is emitted as it glows and pass that light through a prism to split it into all of its component wavelengths or colours, then you'd expect to get this huge spike at 656.28 nanometers because of the hydrogen that's glowing. Except you don't get a spike like that because the hydrogen is in orbit around the black hole and it is therefore moving with some of it coming towards you and some of it moving away from you as it emits that light. So the light is Doppler shifted. So in the same way that when an ambulance races past you, you hear the siren of that ambulance increase in pitch because the sound waves get squashed as they come towards you and then decrease in pitch because the sound waves get stretched out as the ambulance moves away from you, the same thing can happen to light. The waves get squashed, the waves get stretched, but instead of a pitch change, you get bluer light with a squashed wavelength and redder light with a stretched out wavelength. So you don't see a spike when you have moving hydrogen, instead you see a bell shape. It's smeared out because some of the hydrogen is moving away from you, it gets stretched out to a longer wavelength, and some of the hydrogen as it emits the light is moving towards you, so the wavelength gets squashed to a shorter wavelength or bluer light. How much that feature is smeared out by, how much it's broadened by, tells you how fast the gas is moving. The fastest gas will always be closest in towards the black hole, towards that last stable circular orbit that you can have around a black hole. So if you know how fast the gas is moving and you know where it's orbiting as well, you can work out how big is the thing that it's orbiting around. I, if you can measure how broad that spike of hydrogen emission is, then you can measure the mass of a supermassive black hole. 
it's not perfect, no measurement ever is, and it's a very indirect measurement as well. There's also a lot of uncertainty around fitting the shape of that broadened feature of hydrogen emission, and also uncertainty of where that last stable circular orbit actually is around the black hole, and where that inner edge of the disk of swirling material is. We've actually had to calibrate that based on nearby galaxies with growing black holes that have this disk of material around it that you can actually resolve the structure of that material and tell where the light is actually coming from to calibrate these other more distant growing supermassive black holes that we see where the light from this disk of swirling material really does just appear as one single blob in the very center of a galaxy. But after doing this with a handful of supermassive black holes, people started to see correlations with other galaxy properties as well, like the amount of mass in stars or the radius of the galaxy, or also the dispersion in the velocities of stars in a galaxy as well. So you'll also see people just measuring galaxy properties and then taking that correlation to then infer a black hole mass. That's even more uncertain and an even more indirect way of measuring the black hole mass. And you'll never catch me doing it because I've written research papers about how these correlations only hold for the most massive elliptical galaxies and the scatter around that correlation for all other galaxies is actually huge. And so it's very likely that people are massively underestimating their uncertainties when they use that very indirect method of getting at supermassive black hole masses. So as I said, no measurement is perfect, but we do have ways at getting at this. And we're always looking for new ways of measuring it as well. So we can test all the other ways we have of measuring it, see how good they are. Do they agree with each other? Do they agree with this new method that we found? So this month, Nightingale and collaborators did just that for ABLE 1201 with a method called gravitational lensing. Now, our best theory of gravity is still Einstein's theory of general relativity, which says that heavy objects, massive things, curve space itself. And the more massive an object is, the more curvature of space it will cause. And then any objects traveling along that curved space will have their paths deflected, like rolling a ping pong ball across a trampoline with a basketball in the middle. That includes light itself. So as we observe the universe and we see things in the foreground and the background, a picture of the things in the background is distorted by this curved space. So for example, the light from very distant galaxies can be bent by huge clusters of galaxies in the foreground, changing the appearance of the background galaxies, their shape, so they're stretched out into these arcs. Plus, if the alignment of the background galaxy and the foreground cluster is perfect, you can get a full circle, also known as an Einstein ring. You can try this next time you've got a stemmed wine glass in hand and a candle in the background. See if you can make an Einstein ring with your wine glass. And the reason these lensed galaxies, these arcs are very useful is that we can then model, okay, how much mass is in that cluster and where is it? Like map out where all of the mass must be to make a model of it, then say, okay, if I have a background galaxy, what does the light do through that model? And can I recreate the shapes of all of these arcs that I end up with, these gravitational lenses? And so then you can know, okay, this is how heavy this cluster is. We've like weighed the cluster and we've worked out, okay, this is where all of the mass is distributed. And that's exactly what Nightingale and collaborators were trying to do with ABLE 1201, which has one of these arcs almost overlapping it, closer to the center than normal, which allows you to work out just for this galaxy alone, not an entire cluster of galaxies, but just for this single galaxy, how much mass is there? And where is that mass found? And Nightingale and collaborators found that to recreate the shape of the lens, the best models needed more than two components. So the galaxy ones plus a concentrated supermassive black hole in the center. And depending on how you model the mass in the galaxy itself from the light you receive, either as just a disk galaxy, so something that's very flat and very sort of evenly distributed, or whether it's more concentrated in a big sort of spherical ball, or whether it's got both of those components in it, sort of a bulge and then a, a disk as well, you then get different masses for the supermassive black hole that you fit in the center, ranging from 20 billion to 39 billion times the mass of the sun. But if you take all the models and average them, you get 32.7 billion times the mass of the sun, plus or minus 
21 billion times masses on uncertainty either side. Interestingly though, one of the models that Nightingale and collaborators actually tried to fit was one for the galaxy, this foreground galaxy, that didn't have a supermassive black hole in it at all. And at first, when they looked at the fit, it seemed like it was a pretty good one. You know, the statistical score it had for how good of a fit it would be was pretty good and everything seemed okay. But on closer inspection, what they found was that the, the model had essentially added an extra component to the center of the galaxy that was very concentrated, but not quite as concentrated as a supermassive black hole. And then it was also offset from the actual true center of the galaxy that it observed in the image, you know, where the light was actually brightest. So they ended up dismissing that model as although sort of the numbers thought it was a good fit, it was completely unphysical. So this method of gravitational lens modeling is not a perfect measurement by any definition. The uncertainties on these numbers are huge, but the method does have promise. This was done with Hubble Space Telescope data. It's fairly low resolution. It's quite pixelated. But JWST is now giving more survey images that are revealing gravitational lenses like this. And hopefully if we scour through those images, we can find ones that are very close to their galaxy centers to do this supermassive black hole mass measurement. Plus, you've also got the Vera Rubin Observatory coming online, hopefully next year, that's going to survey the southern hemisphere sky in exquisite detail. Again, hopefully finding more of these lenses that we can follow up on and test the limits of this method. So I was so excited to see this research paper pop up and also then the media attention it got after that. Like so many of you sent me the write up on this work saying you must be so excited. And yeah, I was. Not least because the work is great, but also from a personal level, a lot of the researchers are from Durham University, which is where I did my undergraduate master's in astrophysics. Russell Smith, the second author on this paper, was my master's research project supervisor. And I also had lectures given by Alistair Edge and John Lucy as well. So hooray for Durham and their measurement of yet another ultramassive black hole. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn science and maths interactively. They've got thousands of lessons across a huge range of topics, from both basics and advanced maths to physics and even machine learning, with new lessons added every single month. With Brilliant, you're learning by doing. You're not just sat watching a video or memorizing equations. You're building your intuition and your analytical skills to make you a better problem solver. If you want to get to grips with the concept of Doppler shift after watching this video, Brilliant has a whole course on waves and light with a specific section on Doppler shift. So that, you know, the next time I cover this topic in one of my videos, you'll have all the background knowledge and context to understand what's going on. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 of you that go to that link are gonna get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. Well, you'll have to bear with me today because my sinuses, ah. Oh crazy. Like they know that the blossom has come out this week on the trees. <laughs> what a cliche. A physics nerd with allergies. <laughs> smelly cat, smelly cat, it's not your fault. 10 billion times the mass of the sun mark is when we start to throw around the word ultramassive black hole. That's many words, not just one word, Becky. D space is a bit like rolling a ping pong ball along the surface of a trampoline that, you know, it's got like a football in them. I can't use the word football because of the Americans and their hand eggs. <laughs> Now, individual elements glow at different colors or wavelengths. So if you take hydrogen, for example, hydrogen, she's back, <laughs> hydrogen. <laughs> she's a really cool superhero. And if anyone hasn't written that comic yet, I I'd like to see it. <laughs> 